This is a call story. A call story like the stories of Simon and Andrew and James and John at the beginning of the Gospel. This is a call story in which the disciple who is called says no and doesn't follow Jesus. The tone of this story is the tone of Jesus as a spiritual director, as one who is helping this man and his disciples to discern the direction of their calling, of their vocation, and reflecting on that. Now, the spirit of the man's coming up and, and falling at Jesus' feet or kneeling before him is one of, of exaggeration. He is very strong in his subjugation to Jesus and of his throwing himself at his feet to ask this question. So it's overdone. So also is his flattery, good teacher. And so Jesus' response is, first of all, to get things down to a more sober human level, you know. Why do you call me good? You know, no one is good but God. So the the spirit of Jesus' response here is, let's just cool it a little bit and so that we can explore what your, your real question is. Uh, the response of Jesus is then, well, you know the commandments. These presumably are the things that you have to do in order to inherit eternal life. And the man's response after Jesus says this, his recital of the commandments, is probably a response of relief and joy. I've done all these. Does that mean you know, I'm in? Does that mean that I can inherit eternal life? Jesus' response and the tone of it is indicated clearly by Mark. This is one of those instances where you know what the spirit of Jesus' response is. He loved him. And so all of the words that Jesus then speaks to him about leaving everything, selling everything, giving it to the poor, and come, follow me, is spoken out of love. So what's important then in the way in which you tell this is to make these loving words. The man is sad and leaves. And Jesus' words afterwards are also probably sad. That is, these are often heard as commandments or of proclamations or of uh, pronouncements about the difficulties of uh, the rich getting into the kingdom of heaven, almost like prohibitions. But the spirit of this in this story is a spirit of sadness and of recognition of how hard it is. It's a comment on the struggle that he just witnessed as the man considered the possibilities and left. Now, the disciples are perplexed because of their assumptions about the relationship between rich people and the kingdom of God. The general assumption in Jesus' culture was that rich people were blessed by God. That's what it meant to be wealthy, was that God had blessed you. And so the assumption is that the rich are already present in the kingdom of God. Instead, what Jesus identifies is the struggle that is present for rich people of giving what they have for the kingdom of God, and of not being bound by their wealth to maintain basic patterns of you know, the lives of rich people. So his description of this is a metaphor. Now, whether the metaphor is about the gap in the wall, the so-called eye of the needle in the wall in Jerusalem, or is about the eye of a needle which no camel can ever get through, we don't know. Whatever it is, it is an expression of Jesus' recognition of how hard it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of God 
by becoming disciples and of following them, the uh, commands of the kingdom of God. So the disciples recognize this. It looks as if nobody can be saved, that is, can become part of the kingdom of God and be saved from the wrath to come uh, from the structures of the new age. Jesus' response to this is, yes, with people, it is impossible to be saved. There isn't anything that anyone can do, including selling all that they have and giving it to the poor, that makes it possible to be saved. It's only possible with God. God alone can dispose people's spirit to full openness to the kingdom of God. Peter's question is a natural response then. Well, okay, but we've left everything and followed you. What does that mean about us? Does it mean that we cannot be saved either? And Jesus' response is a blessing that whatever anyone has left, they will receive tenfold in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So the promise that the man asked for at the beginning of the story is promised to the disciples at the end of the story. The final comment is, once again, a Jesus qualification. Many will be saved, but many who are first in this age, namely those who have been blessed, those who have been given wealth, will be last. And the last, that is those who are not regarded with honor, who have not been given the gift of wealth in this age, will in the age to come be first. So the paradoxes of the relationship between wealth and the kingdom of God are graphically experienced in this story. A final comment. Notice that Jesus does not say it's impossible for the rich uniquely to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard. It's hard for everybody. For everyone, it is dependent on the grace of God. But the promise is that the wealthy who give their money to the poor, who help to build a more just relationship in the distribution of wealth, will be blessed and will be given the gifts of the kingdom of God. So what is implicit in this story is a blessing of the redistribution of wealth by the gifts of the rich to the poor, and that this is both good for poor people, but at the core of it, it is that it's good for rich people, and that it is a source of their being freed from being bound to the structures of this age, and that they can contribute to the future kingdom of God that is coming.